All right, folks, welcome to Investing for Beginners podcast. Today, we're going to do a bird's eye view. We're going to take a 30,000 foot view look at a company called Alibaba or Baba as the ticker symbol. This is a company based out of China, and we've never really talked about this company much, frankly, if at all. And so this, I think, would be an interesting view for us. So, Andrew, what are your, I guess, initial thoughts on Alibaba and the company? My first impression when you brought this up to me initially was I do know they are in China. I was 95% sure that they were considered the Amazon of China. Mm -hmm. And then I've also known that they've been cheap for a while and Manish Prabhai and Charlie Munger have previously invested in the company. So those were like, you know, when we do these bird's eye views, sometimes it's a business that have very little familiarity with other than mm-hmm. just kind of brand name familiarity but this one has a little bit of a deeper insight and then when i pulled up the 20f which is the international version of the, the 10k the stock for baba is traded on the nyse so the 20f is required and then right there at the top of the 20f they talk about their businesses and it sounds almost I won't say carbon copy, but very, very similar to what Amazon does. So I'm like, okay, yeah, Amazon China. That's a good way to look at it. Mm-hmm. What kind of thoughts like come into your mind when you first looked at this? Uh, there is kind of a wide range of things that I guess I thought of. Number one, if you go on FinTwit, it can be a very polarizing company, partly because of it's based in China. Number two is Charlie Munger owned it. And I think it was a pretty big stake for him. And like you said, Monish Prabhai owned it as well. And those tend to be lightning rod type companies as well. And just because of the nature of that. And then, you know, you can get into all the politics of it too, which we'll try to stay away from. But some of that does have a bearing on an investment like this. So there, there's that. I also knew that it had the brand recognition of, for me, of, kind of being the Amazon of of China. And so that, I guess, was intriguing. And I also know it's been beat up pretty bad. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's some people on FinTwit that have been pretty bullish on the company for a little while now. And I know that they have been doing victory laps a little bit recently just because the company has rebounded more so. I'm talking about the stock price. I'm not talking about like the actual financial performance. But prior to that, it was pretty negative in... I think a lot of people, I don't think they were calling for it to die, but I think they were saying that its best days were behind them. And so that's really about all I know, but that frankly, it was not a company that's really been something I've looked at very deeply. And so it's not something that's really been in on my radar a whole lot. I look at that one year chart and it starts going parabolic in September. And so if you know, you know. You're right. (laughs) So maybe we should start with kind of what what do they do? What does Alibaba do? So from my understanding, they have a letter um, in the beginning, like I said. They say they have two core businesses, e-commerce and cloud computing. And so to me, that makes sense. They say they run Taobao and Tmall Group. And I would assume those are their e-commerce brands. Mm -hmm. So that's really, I mean... To me, I feel like I can understand just generally what kind of a business I'm looking at, you know, from this information. I'm not looking at somebody who drills oil or something. So I start to get a sense just generally, if you're thinking about a company and if you're the type of investor that I am, you probably want to hold this for a long time and hope the company does a lot of the work for you. Both of those things check the boxes of, okay. Mm -hmm. These are industries that are probably going to continue to grow. The company doesn't sound like they'd be rowing upstream in regards to finding long-term growth. And so to me, it checks those two boxes. But honestly, I didn't go any deeper than that because I wanted to dive into numbers. That was all I got from what they do just on a broad level. Did you find anything more interesting? I did find something. Again, I don't know enough about the company to say that this is a big part of their business model. But... Our friend Thomas Chua, who we had on the show 
not too long ago, just had a visit to China and just spent, I think, a week or so there. And he wrote this great blog post, which I can put in the show notes, that kind of talks about some of his observations during the trip. And one of the things he talked about, which which certainly caught my eye, being the payments nerd, was he used a service called Alipay while he was there. And that is part of Alibaba. And basically what it is, is it's, it's a super app and you scan a QR code and then it allows you to access all these services like, you know, train reservations, airplane reservations, ordering food, going to restaurants, you know, maps. It links you to their version of Uber and Lyft, which uh, is a DD. Yeah, DD. I think there might be another one. So it links you to all those services. So you can do all that stuff from one place which I know in the United States, they've tried off and on. Different companies have tried off and on and have failed. But in China, they have they have definitely, with that and WeChat, they've been able to successfully pull that off. And he mentioned also in the article that China doesn't have the same level of infrastructure that we do here in the United States as far as payment rails and you know more of like hardwired, kind of infrastructure, i.e. the cloud and trains and roads and things of that nature. But the way he phrased it was it's actually a benefit for them because they can use something like Alipay or WeChat to make it way more efficient and cleaner for the citizens to do the things that they want to do. And everything here is so fragmented. You know, you were talking earlier about going out to eat. Well, in China, you could do all of that through an app. Whereas we have to go, okay, where is Kava? Where is, you know, California burger? And how do I get there? What's on the menu? What do they offer? All those things we have to go to the site to do it. And then you have to, if you don't know where it is, then you have to go to Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever to get there. Whereas with this, with something like Alipay, you can do it all through the app. And I was thinking to myself, well, that sounds pretty cool. That is something that I kind of discovered as we were, I was actually reading uh, Thomas's article yesterday. So it's kind of apropos that we're talking about this today, but that was something that just kind of jumped out at me was that this company has really, it sounds like it's really been able to integrate themselves very deeply into the culture of, which makes it very, very strong business for sure. And Certainly, you know, with with what 1.6 billion people in the country, they got they got a few people they can service and help. So I think that's a a nice TAM, if you will. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so if you are a newer investor, and let's say that part of the Baba thesis was quite appealing to you, and you wanted to find out, all right, how much of me buying Baba stock will expose me to that tailwind, if you will. Mm-hmm. How is an investor to take that next step down? Um, Do you dive into the 10K? Do you Mm -hmm. Google it? What do you do? Probably all the above. (laughs) Uh, You know, I definitely would go to the 20F or the international 10K and and read through that and see what they have to say. That would be the first place I would go. Uh, The next place I would go would be to Google some of those particular things and see what the Google machine has to say. I would also use uh, FinChat's Copilot and use mm. that to help me do some you know, different digging and research about those different aspects of the company. Because it's a conglomerate, very much like Amazon, it's got a lot of moving parts to it. Yeah. And so the different things about the company that you may or may not be able to pick up directly from the, the 10K or the 20F. And so you, just by looking at through through all this stuff, I can see that there's a lot of different a lot of different services and they generate money in a lot of different ways. I converted the yen to dollars on FinChat and they're doing about 135 billion in revenue a year. So that's less than Amazon, but that's nothing to sneeze at by any stretch. I am also on FinChat. So they what's nice about FinChat, if listeners out there aren't aware, for a lot of the bigger names, there are KPIs that you can look at. Mm-hmm. And so to Dave's point, I would have to read the 20F because there's a lot of segments here where I don't know what these things actually mean. But when a company does disclose it, you can use a tool like FinChat to shortcut some of that time. Literally before FinChat, I was copy-pasting 
you know, like put the the 10k on one side of my screen, put my Excel file on the other side of my screen, and then just go down the list and just type mm-hmm. it all out myself. So really, we are really privileged in this day and age to have tools like this to shortcut our research. Oh yeah. And so in the case of Baba, they have a China commerce revenue type. They have a digital, international digital commerce revenue type. They have some digital media and entertainment. And so you can see what the revenue picture is for each of those segments. And then, you know, every company is going to report different KPIs and and things of that nature. But for Baba, Mm -hmm. they do show the EBIT numbers. And so for me, depending on what part of the moat I'm most excited about, I would want to double check what's the revenue picture, maybe what does that look like compared to peers, and then what's the profitability. In the case of Baba, only Taobao and Tmall Group has positive EBIT, but I'm assuming the negative EBIT segments are probably growing like a weed. That's mm-hmm. what you tend to see with yeah, high growth type businesses. And so when you know when I pulled up Baba on Quick FS, 31% 10-year CAGR, 10 year CAGR on revenues, 10% EPS CAGR on revenues. I mean on EPS. So growing growing quite well. And they've posted some ridiculous year over year revenue numbers. 2021, they grew revenues by almost 52%. Mm-hmm. So truly insane revenue growth. The the profits is something to watch, but I do know based on the shareholders letter that they have a very future forward mindset on a lot of the things they're doing. So those are all kind of the next, as I go down the next step of analysis, when I'm doing a, a bird's eye view on a company, taking those baby steps and analyzing the company and trying to understand it. Those are the things that come into my mind and, and some of the ways you can move past that qu- more quickly and thin chats are great one of the great tools for that yeah it, it really is so if you are kind of trying to parse through the company once you have a handle on maybe what they do do you, you kind of do a, a cursory look through the financials i.e the income statement balance sheet cash flow statement do you try to use metrics or do you just look at the raw data and go okay this is a trend here this is a trend here that kind of thing yeah that's a tricky question to ask a data-driven person <laughs> answer is I, yes all the above the answer is yes <laughs> i like to pull it up on quickfs.net old habits don't die easily mm. and so that's what i do i kind of scan through and look is there anything that just jumps off the page any numbers that really jump off the page and so to bring it back to what I was saying before, you're growing revenues at 30% a year, but you're growing EPS or earnings per share at 10% a year. That's that's interesting. I want to figure out why that's the case. Not to say it's a bad thing, but that is interesting because usually EPS will, will increase along the same lines as your revenue or your sales. So in the case of Baba, that was the first place I looked was, all right, why is revenue growing so much faster than earnings? And so in the case of their margins, there has been margin contraction and it has not been cyclical. So for example, if you look at a steel company, you know the margins are going to be all out of whack depending on where you are in the cycle because it's a huge boost, huge boom, huge bust kind of company. Mm-hmm. In the case of Baba, yeah, they had you know a small drawdown in revenues in 23, but it wasn't anything crazy. And I don't see big swings in the profit margins it's more been a steady decline so then doing that cursory scan of the numbers and just looking and observing from the top level is there anything that really stands out to me that's different than other companies i'll look at Mm. and then that takes me down what my next rabbit hole would be so in this case why is gross margin down from 68 to 38 not to say it's bad but just to say i want to know and understand why and so that would be the next part of the 20th that I would focus on for Baba. Yeah, that's a good takeaway. I would do the same thing. I would look through the margins and see if there's any sort of trend, whether it's up or down or sideways, to give me an impression on that. I noticed as we're looking at FinChat with the company, I noticed that they have been experiencing some impairment of goodwill as well as asset write-downs over the last mm-hmm. few years. And 
as well as some a couple of bigger legal settlements. I guess that was like four years ago. But there's been some, I would call it trash <laughs> in the income statement that has been impacting their their income, their net income, their earnings. And so when you see some of those things, asset write downs or any sort of legal impairments, things of that nature, generally a lot of that's one offs. But if you see them over three, four years, I think that's definitely something you want to dig into and look at. And again, these are just questions you want to ask yourself as you're kind of scrolling through the company. And that's something that kind of jumped out at me as I was looking through their income statement. And I want to know why. I want to know what they are. As an outsider, I want to understand that if I buy this company, is this something that could be a potential risk to my investment? Or is this something that maybe happened with previous management? Because there was a change in management a while ago, kind of during the pandemic, Jack Ma, who was the founder, was forced out of the company. And so I don't know all the ins and outs of that. So I just I just saw that from the outside. So that is something I definitely want to investigate. Yeah, that's an awesome thing to do. And yeah, it does show it right there quite clearly on FinChat on the income statement. What else? What else do you look at? Do you kind of does that wrap up the the overview or what's the next step for you? I mean, if I just look at I would look beyond the, the income statement and look at the balance sheet and the cash flow statement to see if there's anything in there that that jumps out at me. I don't, you know, just doing a cursory glance through them, I don't see anything crazy nuts that would jump out at me that would make me go, uh uh-uh, no, hard pass. It's just more of the, okay, what's this? What's this? You know, those kinds of things that would make me question why is the company, you know, why are they doing this? Is this a good good thing or a bad thing? And everything on the balance sheet to me looks pretty pretty normal-ish like you know things like that would cause me questions like debt or are the liabilities bigger than the assets kind of thing any of that kind of stuff it all looks good like current assets are larger than current liabilities for example they're growing the equity the total assets is growing well it's in pretty steady but all those things don't make me go they also don't make me go oh my god this is like the cleanest balance sheet i've ever seen it looks normal you know if i looked at Amazon's, for example, I would think, you know, the same thing. Okay, strong company. More assets than liabilities. You know, equity is growing. Those are all good things. Yeah, long-term debt hasn't grown an egregious amount Mm -hmm. compared to the equity. I think it's been decreasing, so that's pretty good. Yeah. So that's a good thing to do. I would add that later on in the process, as part of my checklist, I'm actually digging into those numbers, and I recommend doing that or anything you buy also like actually look at the solvency ratios the liquidity ratios all of those things i hope that goes without saying so one last thing i noticed when i was looking through quick fs is i see out of nowhere there's a dividend payment in 2024 so then mm-hmm. that gets my that gets my thoughts on capital allocation and then so flipping to the income statement you see that shares have been reduced several years in a row and so that becomes interesting to me personally because I like to generally invest in companies that are already returning cash to shareholders because it's one less uncertainty. Like you know now they're in that stage and that it's going to be difficult for them from an incentives basis to move away from that. Mm -hmm. And so statistically those tend to perform better, you know, over a a large number of companies. And so that's why I like to see that. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. And, you know, if you kind of dig a little deeper into the capital allocation, you can see they spent roughly 40 billion on buybacks over the last three years, as well as starting to pay a dividend. Those are indications to me that management is thinking seriously about trying to return capital to to shareholders. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, top that with, you know, the, the free cash flow looked like it's pretty steady. So that indicates that the company is profitable and they're able to, you know, continue to keep growing and spend enough to continue to keep growing. But also, as they're probably more on the, air quote, mature side, they're probably, you know, looking at ways that they can return, you know, capital to us, which is always a great thing. Yeah, 
that's another way to describe being in that capital return stage. And it's funny in the the shareholders letter, they, they do mention this too. I like the way they said it. So I'm going to quote it. This is from the chairman and the CEO. In the past 25 years, Alibaba has grown consistently, but unfortunately acquired, quote, large company characteristics. <laughs> so, you know, they reinforce that they are still have this entrepreneurial mindset and they are they have a mission and they're doing long-term thinking but that is something that they are dealing with and for some investors they don't like that because they're trying to swing for you know super big home runs right and that's something to i think always try to figure out like brian feraldi talked about when we had him on the show recently companies have life cycles so as you're analyzing a company it probably helps to figure that out sooner than later Mm because if it doesn't fit your investing style then you're just Mm -hmm. wasting time and there's too many fish in the sea to waste time on something you're not interested in yep yep exactly you know to to kind of further that point i read some i read some analysis on the recent news that amazon is requiring employees to come back to the office and work is that they i think upper management feels like the company has gotten too big and they can't They can't execute fast enough. This person was speculating that the reason why they're doing this is to kind of thin the herd a little bit and be able to make the company leaner so that it can execute on ideas that it wants to to do. So, I mean, it's a $3 trillion company. So, you know, it's not going to execute as fast as, you know, a startup is going to. But um, I think that that is something to be mindful of. When companies get bigger, they may it may slow down an execution. I mean, the market cap for Alibaba is around two hundred twenty-two million, and or I'm sorry, two hundred twenty billion, and so it's quite a bit smaller than Amazon, but it's more you know, multiple it's, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> much, 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 but. I mean, those are all things to keep in mind when you're when yeah. you're analyzing a company is how big is it? How quickly can they pivot? And what kind of optionality do they have? And those are all things to to try to think about. Anything else that on the surface you feel like is worth checking out before just going head over heels down the rabbit hole and like really digging into something like this, which we won't do today. No, honestly, but... <laughs> I think, you know, for me, kind of looking at all the things that we've looked at, you know, do I understand the business model? Do I understand how they make money? Do I understand the financials? And are there, is there anything in there that just is like, no, this is a definite hard pass. And if there's not, then are there some questions that maybe I do need to dig into before I really dive in? Uh, I think the last thing that I would probably want to think about is what kind of risks do I think are pertinent for investing in a company like this? And I, you know, I think there's a couple, there's a couple big ones that jump out at me right off the bat. One is obviously it's an investing in China. And then the other part of it too, is the related is the, how you buy the company and what you actually own. So what are your thoughts on the, the China risk? Well, I'm a little scared cat, so anything China is automatically off of my off of my plate. I just don't have the risk appetite. And for me personally, I think the unproven ground of the VIEs, I don't know how deep we want to go into that, but the unproven ground of that makes me skeptical. Mm-hmm. But I also take China risk with plenty of companies in my portfolio too. Mm-hmm. So Everybody just kind of has to choose what risks are you comfortable with and which ones are you not. Right. And to me, just VIEs are are just a little outside my comfort zone. But you know, if there's different things in the law and things like that, the reason I say all this is um, something that stood out to me when I was trying to read about the the explanation of the way this is all structured. So, Baba Holding Group is in Cayman Islands. Uh, they have a VIE which gives them you know rights to some of the business in china and so it says contractual arrangements in relation to vies have not been tested in court of law so i read that and it just for my personal risk appetite 
disqualifies it. Mm-hmm. But I do see other people who can do the research, get understand the risks, get past the risks, and maybe find a really attractive investment. Mm-hmm. So kind of going back to what we talked about before, where you're looking at the life cycle of the company, asking yourself, does this fit with my what I'm trying to do? Same thing with a, a big black swan risk like this. It's, it's deeper than just China. I know China gets all the headlines, but there are other factors too. And mm-hmm. that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think you know the hard part about investing in China is, for me, is uh, to your point, I have two or three other companies that have big presence in China. But there's a difference. And it may be more psychological than actual tangible difference but that's part of investing is is how you deal with your psyche and how that how that impacts your decisions to buy sell or hold a company and when i think about investing in china because they do not have the same political system that i am familiar with and cuff and comfortable with that leads to some unknowns for me and that makes it harder for me to invest directly in a company like Alibaba, because of that, you know, I don't have the same air quote shareholder protection that I would here if I bought Amazon. And, you know, you could argue, you know, yeah, what you own a couple thousand bucks worth of Amazon. Like, you know, how much protection do you really have? I mean, I mean, and it's a fair Good question, point. right? <laughs> I don't really have much. So, but again, it goes back to behavior and psychology. And so because there's that uncertainty and unknown, then it causes a lot more, I guess, you know, fragility of the holding of the company. So there's that. And then the whole, you know, the VIE slash ADR, all those different types of, of stock ownership also calls into question what really happens if something happens. Like, where do I stand? Do I lose do I lose my $2,000 and I have no recourse kind of thing? Or do I have some sort of recourse? And I don't know enough about it to know yay or nay because I've just never really chosen to invest that way. It's on a need to know basis and I don't need to know. So I just haven't really <laughs> spent the time to learn what I need to know. But because of that, there's an uncertainty and an unknown part of it. And so that makes me a lot more hesitant to in, invest in something like that. I will say this though, that if you took the name off of what we were looking at, I probably would buy this company. It would definitely be on my radar, very high on my radar. Because if you look at the financial performance of the company, it's good. <laughs> they're doing good stuff and they're, you know, they're they're doing all the things that we would want to see as an investor. You have to take that risk part of it into it. And like Andrew said, there's plenty of people out there that have, have gotten past that and have had fabulous returns investing in this company. I think you always have to think about the the fact that you don't have to swing at every pitch. Just because you see something that's awesome and you can't get past the risks, that's okay. You can move on. There's 7,300 other companies or so out there that you could potentially invest in. So there's lots of fish in the sea. So I guess those are some of my thoughts on the, the risk part of it. Love it. Yeah. I think that's very well said. All right. Well, with that, I'll get off my soapbox and we'll go ahead and wrap up the show for today. I hope you guys enjoyed our bird's eye view of Alibaba. If there's any company that you guys would like us to to do a a bird's eye view on, please let us know. Send us a message. You can do it at newsletter at einvestingforbeginners.com. You can reach out to us on the X machine. Andrew and I are both on there. Or you can send us a message on Spotify, their podcast app. So with any of those things, you can send us questions or you can say, hey, can you guys look at so-and-so? And we'll give it a shot. So with that, we'll go ahead and sign us off. You guys go out there and invest with a margin of safety. Emphasis on the safety. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you all next week.